Chase Thomas podcast. The Chase Thomas podcast. <laughs> um, my nephew needs me to record. See, I hate. I already hate it. I hate it. All right, hello. Welcome back to Chase Thomas podcast. Taping this on a Thursday evening with the man of the hour, the man who many are saying are responsible for the Tennessee Volunteers <laughs> going down in flames in the swamp because after. Oh. Years and years of indifference and dodging whether or not Tennessee would win in Florida, win in Gainesville. He went on the record and actually made the pick that the Tennessee Volunteers would go and beat the Florida Gators in the swamp. Brent, I can't help but feel like it really is all your fault. And do you blame yourself for picking Tennessee to beat Florida? Well, somebody asked me how I feel, and I said I'm Charlie Brown. And Mm -hmm. Lucy's pulled the football out again, and I should know better. Charlie kept coming back. It didn't matter if it was the Halloween special, the Thanksgiving special, or just a regular Saturday cartoon of Charlie Brown. Mm -hmm. Lucy was always taking the ball out, and he was always landing on his backside. I knew better. Um, It was one of those deals. Friday Friday evening, I was like, I've made a mistake. I should have never picked Tennessee to win. And um, I did. And uh, now I can go back to say I'm never going to pick them to win again in Florida until they beat Florida at Florida. So, um, you know, I don't I obviously didn't have anything to do with it, but Tennessee went back to the house of horrors and had another horrible experience in that house. Now that it's been what um, nearly a week here, five days, what what's changed from what you immediately thought coming out of the game to now? What's changed in your thought process from the Florida game? Um, you know, I thought that think the offensive line played very well and I think they I think they significantly missed Darnell Wright and Jerome Carvin but if you compare in Florida game to Florida game from a year ago the, the reality in this game that you I think you saw is Tennessee is trying to figure out life without Hendon Hooker mm. and it's not because Joe Milton's awful I know everybody's ready to go on to the next guy and I understand that that's the life of a quarterback It's not that Joe's playing awful. It's Joe's not making the plays. And that's not his game to make the freelance plays that that Hendon Hooker made. I mean, you go back to the Florida game a year ago. I thought the offensive line played pretty well a year ago. But you really look at it, and it was was so much Hendon Hooker. He had a 44-yard run. But then he also had a handful of plays where – Florida had a free rusher, Florida pressured, Florida had things going on. Not only did he avoid a negative play, but he turned it into a big time positive play. The whole game changed a year ago in this in this matchup when when he converted a third down to Princeton fan on a play that he should should have never probably gotten the ball off. Free you know, free blitzer, free rusher. He slide steps to his left, throws back over into the middle of the field to Princeton fan for a first down. Then the Ronald Keaton catch, and the Brew McCoy touchdown, because he has Lee going to the locker room. They have all the momentum, and it turns into what it turned into. Joe just Joe has a hard time making those plays. Uh, off schedule, um, freelance type stuff. We've just not seen him make many of those plays. He made one in the Florida game. He he made a really good play in the Austin P game, but Dante Thornton dropped the ball. But he just hasn't made a lot of those what you call off schedule play. The Emperor's improvising um you know taking a a a, a somewhat of a busted play and making it something hendon hooker had a great ability and i think i've figured this out more and more this week as i've looked at things a great ability to mask a mistake by teammates on the offensive side of the ball i joe hasn't shown that ability to be able to cover up a mistake or two made by somebody that's probably where I'm at the end of the week more than I was Sunday and Monday when you, you were trying to figure out you know what all was going on and what happened with this offense. Now we'll get to the defense in a second. That's my takeaway from the offense. Uh, the takeaway from the defense is they missed Keenan Peely really bad. Um, young linebackers are learning on the job, and that's a tough place to do. And the secondary is still the secondary. They, they haven't taken any kind of step from last year to this year. They're better up front in terms of pass rush, but teams are going to continue to get it out of their hand quick, Chase, and until Tennessee shows the ability to be able to stop that on the back end or control it on the back end better than they did. Yeah, and I think, too, the off-schedule stuff, and I think that's maybe part of the reason more folks are just more – because I've been talking to – like, <laughs> it's just kind of 
I don't know if it's like this in fall because I mean the general's quarters has been a uh, flamethrower nest, uh, a hornet's nest uh, all week uh, for Joe Milton takes and everything fall coming out of the Florida game. But something that I have just come back to when you watch this and kind of speaks to what you're talking about with and in the last two years and ball fans getting kind of like it, you just kind of get used to that level of efficiency and having the best offense in the country and a lot more of that was Hendon than we uh, maybe have anticipated previously but we talked about it on the program Brent months ago in the Clemson game where people really bought into what that looked like and part of it was Darnell was still there Cooper was healthy um things were a little bit different uh on that side of things but he also had a lot of three and outs it wasn't like this pretty game he had the deep shots he had the squirrel bomb and he had some big plays but there was that just kind of the tempo wasn't the same and there were some issues that i jotted down that i was like i think this is something to monitor because i think and what you guys talked about all offseason was look the offensive line struggling the offensive line is going to be there's going to be a step back they're just there's no way around it and what I keep coming back to and why I think it's less about Joe at this point and more about the circumstances of Joe Milton being in this particular offense with this particular offensive line this year that I don't see a way out of this in terms of, look, the vertical passing game is not there. Um, they started force feeding and I want to pick your brain on this too, but I don't know if Cooper's gone and we'll see. <laughs> it seems like he's not going to play uh, this Saturday against UTSA and kind of what you've been saying this week. It's like when he plays, then I'll operate on the assumption that Cooper's back. But until then, we should operate on the assumption that he's not back this week or really <laughs> until we just see Cooper Mays again. But you look at it, Jeremiah Crawford overmatched last week, really rough outing for him. Andre Courage, you don't really know what you're getting from him week to week at the left guard spot. I just look at it with Joe not freestyling, Joe not being comfortable in his just who he is at this point with how many years in college football, he's not going to change all that much. He's still going to not take the shot, the, the little things where he runs out of bounds in the two point conversion try instead of just trying to toss something up and see what he can get. There are certain things where he's never going to be comfortable running and uh, taking off and doing stuff when things break down. That's just not Joe Milton. The problem is there's not alternatives on the offensive line this year to fix that situation to make it easier for joe over the course of this year and this is all he's got is this one year and unfortunately he doesn't have the offensive line that tennessee had a year ago to kind of elevate joe and let him get the time to do the 90 yard bombs to do what he get did against mizzou and mop up duty where he has all day to throw uh squirrel 90 yards down the field where brent musper or uh, uh rick new loses his mind as the ball continues to soar through the air I don't see how that happens this year, Brent. And I think that's where they're going to, the rubber meets the road with Joe and Nico is that if you're looking at 16 points again, or you're looking at a, another low scoring affair and Josh Heupel not being able to win, not without the ball scoring 30 points uh, a night. I just, I don't see how that works. Is that fair to just be like, I don't know what they do if the offensive line is about where they've been to this point. And Joe is the kind of quarterback he is with, and expecting this offense to be a 30 plus point offense juggernaut again. Well, they, they've got to, they've got to create, they've got to be more creative, create some mm. things. Um, and, and again, part of this too is um, when, if, if teams are going to be able to line up uh, and, and we saw this Thursday night in the coastal Carolina game, right? Mm. I mean, McCall's a really good player, really good quarterback struggled in the first half. They didn't put up a bunch of yards, didn't put up a bunch of points in part because they couldn't run the football against Georgia, Georgia mm -hmm. State. If, if Tennessee, when they have a numbers advantage in the box, if they can't run the football effectively, however that is, by whatever means that is, okay, if that's jet sweep suddenly, if that's forcing Joe to run, whatever, if they can't win in a light box, then this offense is going to struggle to get tempo. Against Virginia, light box to start the game. What did Tennessee do? Gash, 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 and gash again, right? They didn't do that hardly as effectively against Austin P. And then against Florida, Florida figured out after the first drive, hey, let's see if we can control the front with four and, and, and a couple of linebackers. Let's see if we can keep six in the box, essentially, and play football against these guys and, and win up front. They, they, they could, and they did. And so the result of that is now the, the, the passing game becomes a more precision game. You've got to throw it into windows. You've got to hit zones. You're not going to be able to run some of the stuff that Tennessee fans are used to seeing them run. Opening series, Josh Heupel goes to 
you know, exhibit A, 1A of the Josh Heupel offense. He runs a switch route with Brew McCoy and Squirrel White. Squirrel's the inside receiver. Brew basically runs a basketball pick. He goes a slant. He takes Squirrel's man, who's got him man-to-man. Squirrel bounces outside. He's vertical down the field wide open. It's the same thing that Valus Jones ran against Kentucky two years ago. It, it, it's, it's, it's the same thing Jalen Hyatt's run. It's, it's a staple in the Josh Heupel offense. So you say, why don't you do that all the time? you got to have man coverage to be able to do that. And, and so Florida played man, brought an extra guy on that play, right? Tennessee, Tennessee missed him. I mean, John Campbell gave up the pressure because he didn't block him very well. Joe stayed in there, stood in tall, threw, threw a, a good enough ball, you know, a fine ball, put it out there where Squirrel could catch it. It's a 43-yard gain. They come back down two plays later, three plays later. Florida brings pressure from Joe's right side. They leave Ramel Keaton on that same right side, one-on-one. Keaton gets an unbelievable release. The DB never got his hands on him. Joe throws a great ball for a touchdown. And you're thinking, they, they got it. They figured mm-hmm. it out. They've, you know, they've unlocked the, the key to it all. And then Florida said, you know what, we're going to play zone and, and we're going to play more zone and we're going to you know, rush with four and see if we can get home. And they could. And then Tennessee got themselves in a situation behind the sticks, right? So first drive goes beautifully. Out of the next four drives, next three drives, excuse me, Tennessee had a penalty on every one of those drives. They also had a fumble in there that they recovered. And it was just a complete and utter, we don't have tempo, we can't get going. My point in all of this is is this. Guys around Joe have to play better for Joe than they had to play for Hendon. Mm. You could make a mistake for Hendon, and he could mask it easier for you. You bust a route, Hendon might squirt out for five yards, run out of bounds, live to play the next play. Right? You 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 blow an assignment off the edge. Hendon steps up, makes a play, or takes off running, or whatever. They don't have that big of a luxury for for errors like they had a year ago on the offensive side of the ball. Because because of Joe's not showing, and and we've never seen Joe's ability to be a real, you know, breakdown kind of run guy. Now you can run, you can run single wing with him, like yeah. you did in the Clemson game, and do some things. You might be able to design something here and there, but to just go backyard on people, Joe's not shown that. So what you have to do is the guys around him have to play cleaner. Yeah. So the challenge, you know, is going to be for the offensive line, tight ends running backs, all those guys, they have to play more mistake-free. Nobody plays perfect, but they have to clean up their errors and their mistakes if this offense is going to be the have some semblance of efficiency. They're not going to score 44 points a game. They're not going to break national records. They're not going to be what they were a year ago, but nobody thought they were going to be that a year ago. You just thought they were going to score more than 16 points at Florida. Yeah. I mean, you had a worse showing than you did the first year at Florida, and Hendon Hooker was just thrown into it. I mean, the game got away from you in the second half because you couldn't get Emory Jones off the field. But that was, I mean, was that the worst showing in the Hypel era thus far of any of any game? Was this past Saturday? Yeah, was that the worst? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably the worst that they've played. Yeah. Because, and here, here, let me say this.